The Battle of Stalingrad, fought between August 1942 and February 1943 between Germany and the Soviet Union, was monumental in many ways. The importance of the battle for both sides, its enormous cost in life and limb, the viciousness of the fighting, the brutal conditions in which it was fought, its many heroic and tragic stories, and what the victory meant to the Soviets and their allies, the United States and Great Britain. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today's topic is the epic Battle of Stalingrad and the men and women who fought in it. Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941 with an army of three million men. Until the Soviets began their attacks on Europe in 1944, Hitler's invasion was the largest military operation up to that time. From June through most of the fall, the Germans drove deeper and deeper into the Soviet Union from the Arctic Circle in Finland to the coast of the Black Sea in today's Ukraine. Many Germans, including Hitler, believed the war would end quickly. Though it did seem that way by the beginning of October, two things happened. Soviet resistance began to stiffen, and the infamous Russian winter started to set in. Hitler's armies were stopped at the gates of the Soviets' two biggest and most important cities, Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, and the capital, Moscow. Though many books and articles make it seem like the Germans were surprised by the cold of the German winter, they weren't. They and everyone else on the planet knew, at least by reading about it in history books. No, the Germans knew what was coming. But in one of the biggest miscalculations of the war, they believed they could defeat the Soviets before the winter really set in. Nope. In late spring 1942, Hitler wanted to go on the offensive again. Still, many of his generals believed it would be better for the Germans to take their gains and build strong defenses around them, not attack deeper into Russia and lengthen their supply lines, which were already 1,000 miles long in some places. Hitler would have none of that. But he did know that his forces weren't strong enough to attack the entire front line like they had planned the previous June. So, for his attack, he chose to attack the Soviets in the south, through the part of the Ukraine he hadn't yet conquered, down into the Caucasus to seize the vital oil fields there, and push on the city the Soviets touted as a model of communist ideals, which of course bore their leader's name, Stalingrad, Stalin's fortress, or City of Stalin. Stalingrad sat on the western side of the all-important supply route on the Volga River, and cutting the river in two at Stalingrad was one of Hitler's primary goals. The main German formation moving on Stalingrad was the 6th Army, led by General Friedrich Paulus who had a mind for logistics and movement, but had not led a formation this size into battle in his military career. Along with the Germans were armies from Romania and Hungary, German allies but bitter enemies. The Romanians and Hungarians were placed at opposite ends of the front, so they wouldn't begin fighting with each other and the Soviets. Paulus's force numbered nearly 300,000 men, 500 tanks, 600 planes, and 3,000 artillery pieces. It was a strong force but it had some weaknesses, one of them being that despite all the Nazi propaganda about its mechanized and modern army, most of the transport at the front and for a considerable distance behind it was done by horse and wagon, just as Napoleon's army had when they invaded Russia in 1812 and lost. Germany lacked trucks and fuel for its trucks. What railways there were destroyed by the Soviets as they retreated. We saw the conditions of the roads in much of Ukraine and Russia over this last year of the war in 2022-2023. They were worse in 1942, what there were of them. Those weren't the only problems. Many trucks began to freeze solid, becoming unusable. Trucks freeze faster than horses, but horses still freeze. And when winter started to set in, German supply lines began to bog down. Stalingrad was a perfect target for the Germans to attack by air. It was a large city in a small valley next to one of the largest rivers in the world on a grassy plain of rolling hills. As the 6th Army approached Stalingrad, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was ordered to bomb it ahead of them, thinking they would kill many Soviet troops, terrify civilians, and destroy essential factories and other vital installations. The German bombing lasted for three days, but much of the damage was done on the first day. August 23rd, when 1,600 German missions were flown over the city, dropping 1,000 tons of high explosives and incendiary bombs. 
which set much of the city's residential areas on fire. Over the next two days, German planes repeatedly returned, dropping firebombs. No one knows the exact number of Soviet soldiers and civilian men, women, and children killed in the bombing or trapped under the city's rubble, dying a slow death through injury or being trapped and dying of thirst. Stalin had refused to give the order for civilians to be evacuated from the city. As history books have said, he believed his soldiers would fight harder if they knew they were directly protecting civilians. Still, he also needed workers in the vast factory complexes of the city, which, despite the initial bombing, managed to keep producing for much of the early part of the battle. Eventually, the Soviet dictator relented, but even then, many civilians in the city either could not get out or chose to stay and help the soldiers. The 6th Army had no trouble finding the city. A plume of smoke over two miles high showed them exactly where it was, but the bombing of the city had been a mistake. The ruins of Stalingrad made it a fortress, with many covers, tunnels, and natural defensive positions. Moreover, the bombing didn't touch the city's sewers, and the Soviets, and then the Germans, began to use these tunnels for movement, supply, and small headquarters areas. The fighting in Stalingrad was called the War of the Rats because of the action underground, the savagery of the fighting within the ruins, and the dirty faces, clothes, and vicious attitudes that developed among those who fought there. The Germans took most of the city by the last part of September. Still, they could not dislodge the Soviets from their position in a pocket along the riverbank that included large fuel tanks that the Germans wanted to avoid hitting so that they might capture their contents. The fighting along the front by the riverbank was intense, and the Soviets figured out German tactics. And as they did their calculations about how many men they would need to hold a part of the city, they began to formulate a plan. But that making that plan happen might be a long shot and might not happen for months. The Soviets had just under 190,000 troops in the city area at the start of the battle, along with 2,200 guns, 400 tanks, and 300 planes, primarily old and ineffective planes. To replace the losses of the city, which was quickly cut off from the rest of Russia except across the Volga, the Soviets brought men across the river in virtually every boat they could lay their hands on. The Volga is wide, especially at Stalingrad. And from the moment replacements got off the trains leading them to the riverbank and the ferries, they were under tremendous German artillery fire and air attack. Many thousands of Soviet soldiers never made it over the river during the battle. Many were killed on their boats, went down with them, or were wounded in the water and drowned or run over by their own vessels. In the 2003 movie about the battle, Enemy at the Gates, replacements are shown waiting in line for rifles. Every other man is given a weapon, and the other is told, when the man in front of you falls, take his rifle. There is no doubt in the officers' minds, the first man will die. Probably the third and fourth man too, for a large number of Soviet replacements had never been in combat, and in many cases, never been given any training. What's worse, the Soviets used blocking formations of NKVD secret police troops to prevent anyone from retreating. Their men shot those caught running away, a tactic used by Russians in Ukraine today. Still, the Soviets fought with a tenacity and truly terrified the Germans. Many Red Army men would not give up and fought to the last against incredible odds. Here are two great examples of this among many. Soviet General Vasily Chuikov, who looked as tough as he was, had his headquarters in an underground bunker near the fuel storage tanks by the river. His position was constantly in danger of being overrun and along with it, the only reinforcement point for the Soviets in the city. During one attack, one of the storage units went up in flames, that is to say, exploded, and flaming oil ran into the Soviet trenches, burning men as it went. Chuikov was giving orders in his bunker as burning oil ran over it and survived. A famous story has a number of Soviet soldiers who had caught on fire, running at German positions, firing their weapons along the way before falling into the enemy trench, setting them on fire as well. Today, one of the world's largest freestanding statues, the Motherland Calls, stands in Mamayev Kurgan, an ancient burial site and now a memorial to the battle. Mamayev Kurgan changed hands so many times, people lost count. 
On one day, the hill changed six times. It was a vital observation point and was used for artillery spotting. Beyond Mamayev Kurgan, near where the Stalingrad Museum is today, there was an apartment building that came to be known as Pavlov's house, after the Soviet sergeant who commanded the small Soviet unit, which defended the critical position. Though the Soviets would bring in reinforcements by night and sometimes from underground, they were always outnumbered by the German attackers, who sometimes controlled half the building. The fighting inside the building was room by room, with grenades, pistols, submachine guns, knives, fists, feet, teeth. German tank attacks failed, because Pavlov's men would use anti-tank weapons to pierce the thin top armor from above. The entire area around Pavlov's position was a charnel house. There were two main factory complexes inside Stalingrad. The Red October Steel Factory near the city center, which supplied finished steel to the tractor factory in the north, which had begun to make tanks and armored vehicles when the Germans attacked in 1941. The tractor factory complex was the size of a small city itself, and within it and around it, more than 30,000 men died in the first months of the battle. As the battle went on, both sides poured reinforcements into the city. At its highest level, Axis forces, Germany, Hungary, Romania, had about 600,000 men, 400,000 German and 100,000 each for the Romanians and Hungarians. The Germans used their allies to guard the flanks of their offensive actions in the city, and they did not take part in the fighting in the rubble of Stalingrad during the battle. There are two main reasons. They were not very good troops. And because they had not been trained properly, the Germans supplied them with old, out-of-date weapons and very few tanks, a decision that would haunt them in November. For their part, the Soviets kept up the strength in the pocket by the river and slowly expanded it. Then the Germans would counterattack, and on and on. But as we said, the Red Army had a plan. One of the plans for both sides was to send in their most skilled troops to take a toll on the enemy or dislodge them from well-defended positions. The Germans brought in highly skilled, motivated veteran combat engineers to take the tractor factory, where battles raged above and below ground, not only with machine guns, grenades, and knives, but German flamethrowers. Civilians caught in the crossfire were killed every day. Both the Soviets and Germans had skilled snipers in their ranks, but the Soviets made sniping an art form in Stalingrad. What's more, one of the enduring symbols of the Soviet fight in the city was a sniper, the famous Vasily Zaitsev, who is credited with 242 confirmed kills in four months, and likely more. He was joined by hundreds of others, including many women, who are some of the world's most skilled and famous snipers. One thing, however, even before the popular movie Enemy at the Gates told the tale, the Soviets and Russians have kept alive the story of the famous sniper duel between Zaitsev and a German major named Koenig. It never happened. Very effective Soviet propaganda. The cold affected both sides, though it is true that after a time, the Soviets began supplying better and more equipment and clothing to their soldiers in the city. At the same time, the Germans weren't even able to fly, pull, or carry in enough supplies to feed their army by the time the Soviets dropped the boom on them in November. One little-known Soviet trick was to put a drop or two of gasoline in their gun oil which prevented the oil from gumming up in the cold and disabling the weapon. With few exceptions, German units had to make do with their summer uniforms, and perhaps a coat or tunic, neither of which was suited for the temperatures of the Russian late fall and winter, and that year, temperatures in Stalingrad frequently dropped to minus 40 for days on end. Fahrenheit and Celsius temperatures are precisely the same at minus 40, by the way. For those of you in the USA, at minus 40, the temperature has to go up 73 degrees to get to the freezing point. Think about that. Some German soldiers wore captured Russian clothing under their own or under their helmets, but unprotected noses and ears literally fell off, as did fingers, toes, and feet. Almost everyone in the German army in Stalingrad had frostbite or gangrene from frostbite. What's more, they weren't getting enough food to keep up their strength, not only for fighting, but for healing. Inside the bunkers and makeshift hospitals, wood and coal from the ruins kept fires burning and attracted thousands upon thousands of rats trying to escape the cold. That brought disease, but also food. By the end of the battle in late January and early February, most of the rats of Stalingrad had been eaten 
long before. The planet Uranus played an important role in pre-Soviet Russian mythology and was chosen as the name of the counteroffensive to defeat the Germans in and around Stalingrad. In the first part of the war, Stalin tried to micromanage things himself. Still, unlike Hitler, he recognized that he was not a professional soldier. In the winter of 1941-42, he gave command of much of the Red Army to Georgi Zhukov, who became one of the war's most famous commanders. Zhukov and his staff devised a plan not to push the Germans out of Stalingrad, but keep them in forever. To do this, they carefully and secretly conserved the plentiful reinforcements that poured into the area almost daily. By the time Operation Uranus began, the Soviets had over 1 million men gathered north and south of the city, along with over 1,000 planes, nearly 900 tanks, and most impressive, over 13,000 artillery pieces. The best part from the Soviets' point of view? The Germans and their allies had no idea they were there. Some had an inkling that something was up, but Hitler and most of his general staff believed that the Soviets were on their last legs. They thought the same thing the previous year, too. On November 19, 1942, these one million men came screaming the Soviet war cry, Hurrah! and crashed into and through the Hungarians and Romans on the city's flanks. Their goal was for the two prongs of the Soviet attack to meet some miles west of Stalingrad trapping the Germans in a giant pocket and preventing them from breaking out and other Germans from breaking in. The combat that ensued was brutal, and while their ranks were depleted by losses, sickness, and much else, the Germans were skillful veteran fighters and took a high toll on the Red Army, but took tremendous losses themselves. Much of the combat took place outside of the city in fields, woods, villages, and towns, while the Soviets inside Stalingrad began to slowly push the Germans into two large pockets, one in the north and one in the south of the city. When word got to German General Paulus about the Soviet counterattack, he and his generals formed a plan to break out of the city and meet another German attack coming from the west and breaking the encirclement. They might have been able to if they had acted fast enough, but they were slowed by indecision, and then an order from Hitler to stay where they were. He would send troops to them. This effort, led by one of the Germans' best generals, Erich Manstein, failed. It had had no chance of success to begin with. Moreover, Luftwaffe chief Hermann Göring promised that his planes could bring in 3,000 tons of supplies daily to the defenders. He hadn't been able to do that before the Soviet counterattack, and the Germans could only average 250 tons. Men began to starve at a greater rate. Men went mad. For a time, a small number of German wounded could be evacuated by plane, but more and more were shot down on the way in and out as time went by, until they finally stopped. German soldiers were so afraid of what would happen to them if captured that many committed suicide rather than being taken prisoner. Crowds often rushed leaving planes, held back by military police that had shoot-to-kill orders. Some men stormed onto the wings. Those planes that could take off shook desperate men off the wings to stay airborne. Hundreds fell to their deaths. Hitler promoted Paulus to field marshal on January 20th, 1943 knowing that no German field marshal had ever been taken alive by the enemy. Paulus surrendered despite this on the same day. A few days later, a pocket of a few thousand German soldiers in another part of the city gave up. 90,000 Germans went into Soviet captivity. Survivors were released in dribs and drabs for 10 years. Only 5,000 German soldiers ever returned to their homeland. There were nearly 1 million Axis casualties in the battle. The Soviets suffered more than one million dead, wounded, and missing. Stalingrad was the turning point in the war in the Soviet Union, and perhaps the war, though much hard fighting remained before the Germans were pushed out of the Soviet Union and victory in Berlin in 1945. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.